no, 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 no. This is a terrible way to do this. I don't know why this is what I was thinking at the time. I get a lot of questions about how to perform well in a coding interview, and there's so much more than actually just writing good code. So what I want to do in this video is break down and sort of react to a coding interview that I did over on Clement's channel about a year ago. So this is a sort of Google style front end JavaScript coding interview. Okay, so let's start the video. What's up everybody, how's it going? So you all seemed to really enjoy the recent Google front-end coding interview that I did with Connor, who is the front So also, by the way, we have done like four of these. So if you do want to see reactions and sort of breakdowns of the other ones, do let me know. Also, it's crazy to see I only had 1,600 subscribers at the time when we were filming this. So and love to see that growth. Creator on Algo Expert. By the way, if you're a software engineer preparing for technical interviews, do check out my company, Algo Expert. Go to algoexpert.io. Use promo code CLEMCLEM for I'd prefer you use code Connor, C O N N E R, for a discount, but Clem works too. Down on the platform. And so I decided to redo some interviews with Connor. In this video, I'm going to be interviewing him with some pure JavaScript problems. So not even HTML, CSS, DOM manipulation. No, just pure JavaScript. You're going to see really fun problems that I asked him. We also did another interview on his YouTube channel, a React coding interview, because we recently launched some React content on Front Expert. Definitely go check it out after you watch this video. I'll post the link to that other interview on his channel in the comments and in the description below. And with that, enjoy this JavaScript coding interview. All right, Connor, are you ready for this pure JavaScript coding interview? Yep, I'm ready. I, I was I was not ready. I don't think I've been more nervous before an interview other than this one. Like I was far more nervous in this sort of mock interview than I've ever been in a real interview. But anyways, let's get going. Okay, so for this interview, I'm going to have you implement three utility functions that are either based off of native JavaScript library functions or off of you know functions that are found in popular NPM packages like Lodash. So we're going to implement promise.all, deep equals, and get timer. We'll get into the last two when we finish the first one. So the first one is promise.all. It's based off of the native you know, promise.all function on the promise object in JavaScript. And uh, the way that it works is it takes in an array of promises and it returns an array of the resolved values of those promises. The resolved values should be in the order that the promises are taken in, in the input. And um, the promise.all should resolve once all of the promises that were consumed have resolved. And it should reject if any one of the promises rejects. Okay, sounds good. So basically just the native promise.all function? Exactly. So as a quick note, this is a very common thing in front-end interviews to sort of implement some native built-in JavaScript function, but to have to do it yourself. So whether it be a promise function or something like array map, array for each, things like that, just to sort of see how well you understand how the language actually works. So this is a pretty common type of thing to be asked. Okay, so let's delete this code first of all. And let's see, so we need to keep track of the sort of output of each promise. So let's create an array for that first of all. So we can say const output, and I'll make this an empty array. And then, so already, I do think this is a bit of a mistake. So whenever you are in a coding interview, whether it be a front-end interview or something completely different, you should start by explaining from a high level what it is that you're going to do, just to show the interviewer that you are thinking about this problem in a critical way, that you understand the problem, and to show them that the approach that you're following is potentially the correct approach. Because if it's not, then instead of getting straight into coding that incorrect approach, they can sort of help guide you along the way to get to a better approach. So almost always, I would say, don't jump straight into writing code like I did here. Instead, spend at least 30 seconds to a minute, if not substantially longer, explaining exactly what it is that you plan to do with your code. We need to know when each of the promises has resolved. So we can do that with, we can't await the promises because then we'd end up doing them one after another, essentially. So we need to, um, I guess, have like a dot then chain to each promise. So let's loop through our promises. So we can say for, I guess we can use for each. So we can say promises dot for each promise. Okay, so for each promise, we want to add to the output 
once the promise has resolved. So we can say promise dot then. And in the case of dot then, that means we know it has resolved. So we can go into a callback function here. And all we need to do, I think, is add to our output the resolved value. So we can say output dot push. Or actually, we don't want to just push because that could end up making them out of order. So we can say output at i, and we'll add i to our for each loop. So promise and i, we are going to add the value. And we need this value here. OK. And then, so now we are adding all. So one thing I do think I'm doing super well in this example is sort of explaining every single bit of code I'm writing, which is something I'd recommend you do in your coding interviews. Sometimes you see people sort of write out whole functions, then try to explain them or write out big blocks of code. But one thing I like to do is basically with every keyword I write, explain why I'm doing that. So for example, you saw me sort of start to use the push method and then explain why, oh wait, push isn't going to work. We need to do array at i because we need to keep the original order, not the order that they finished. And just sort of small things like that make it way easier for the interviewer to, one, understand that you actually know what you're doing, but also just to follow along with the code you're writing. Because it is pretty difficult as an interviewer to watch somebody else code and sort of mentally keep track of what exactly it is that they're doing. So that helps them out a lot and just showcases your ability as a programmer. The values to our output, but we still need to actually return. Uh, and I guess we're returning a promise itself, right? So let's yeah. create a promise and we'll do all of this code inside of the promise function, I guess the executor function, I think it's called. So let's say return new promise and the promise constructor takes in a function with the resolve and reject function. Okay. And we can pass in all of this code inside of this function. Oh, messed up the indentation when I did that. Let's tab that over. Okay. So now we create this promise and we need to, after the last one of these has been added to the outputs array, we want to actually return or we want to resolve the promise. So the way we can do this, we can't just check outputs.length because we could be adding things like at the end of the array. So like if the first one to resolve is the last promise, then the length of that array is going to update. So we need a counter. So we can say let um, we can call it settled promise counter equal zero. And whenever we settle a promise, or I guess resolve a promise, we will. So just a small thing, naming conventions do matter, even in coding interviews. This isn't competitive programming where you're just trying to write something as quick as possible and with as little code as possible and getting it to just work as quickly as possible. You're trying to make code that's readable, that's sort of similar to production code. So it's good to have these better naming conventions. But here I mentioned settled promise counter. And then I say, well, actually, that's not settled promises. It's just fulfilled promises. So I should have renamed it when I said that to fulfilled promise counter. I think that just would have showed a little bit of care for these fine details of code quality. It's fine as settled promise counter too. So no rejected promise is ever going to contribute to that counter. So I just think that's a slightly better variable name. But anyways, I think this is fine too. Increment this counter. So we can say settled promise counter plus plus. And now if we have resolved all of the promises, so if settled promise counter is the same as promises.length. So if we have resolved all of the promises, then we want to resolve our main promise. So we can say resolve and we will pass in the outputs array. And then you said in the case that any of the promises uh, rejects, the whole thing should reject. So we can add a catch block down here. Uh, so let's say dot catch and we can just call reject. So this will reject with the first rejection message, I guess. Um, yep. Yeah. So one thing I've done here that I don't think is very good is I haven't tested anything. So I've just written, let's see, about 17 lines of code. And I haven't tested that any of that works. So one thing I would recommend is as you're doing this or as you're going through a coding interview, try just logging some things out as you go and sort of do some very basic tests to make sure that the code you're writing is actually going to work. I think I get pretty lucky in most of this interview, if I remember correctly, where most of these things end up working. 
But in general, I would say to spend some time to try to test things out a little bit more than I'm doing here. So before I added the catch, I probably should have just tested that the previous portion worked. Even before I added this whole new promise wrapper, I could have tested that just the for each loop was working, for example. Yeah, I think this should work. <laughs> okay. Do you think you might have a bug or perhaps a typo in your code? Oh, so there we go. I guess I did make a mistake. Oh, it looks like oh, since I you're saying that, I'm sure on. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, let me try running the code and I'm sure I'll find the typo when I do that. So, okay. um, promise.all needs to take in an array of promises. So I'll come to the sandbox and say const promises is going to be equal to an array. And I'll just do promise. I'll just pass in promise.resolve to here. So it'll just already be resolved, but we'll run the code and unhandled promise rejection cannot read property of undefined reading for each. Uh, well, here you clear out the past promises to promise all. Like literally in the sandbox on line seven. You oh, I see. Promises. Yeah, promises. Yep. Okay. Uh, output is not defined. Oh, did I say output instead of outputs somewhere? I did. Outputs. Yep. yep. Okay, so that Run was code. the Okay, cool. So promise.all this, and let's just say dot then console.log to log out the result. And okay, yeah, so we get an array of two. If we throw an error in here, so let's say promise dot reject error, we should now instead get, yeah, so we get this unhandled promise rejection error because we rejected our promise. Yep. And if we resolve with something else, so resolve as a string, we should have an array of two and resolve. Yep. So this is, I think, mostly good in the sense that I'm going through some test cases. But one thing I'd recommend is to try to really think about all of the edge cases during an interview and show the interviewer proactively that you're thinking about those. So I should have also shown what an empty array is going to do. What's going to happen if all of the promises reject or if there's a ton of promises resolving or if some of the promises don't resolve for some period of time, there should have just been a lot more test cases to look at, or at least I should have just mentioned them to him so that I sort of showcase that I'm thinking about these different edge cases because that is a very important part of being a good software engineer. And just try a few more, like imagine you put, I don't know, five promises. Yeah, let me also check if the promise doesn't resolve immediately. So let me create another promise, const slow promise. It's going to be equal to new. Okay, so it looks like I did think about some of these, but again, I would have preferred to have proactively done this before he sort of had to mention it to me that I should be looking at other potential cases. Promise, uh, resolve, and I'll just say set timeout, uh, and we will resolve the promise. Resolve, done. And I'll just do this after like 100 milliseconds just so that when the function initially runs, this isn't resolved. Okay. So let's do that. And Cool. So we got done. So it essentially, I guess, waited for that to finish. Um, yep. Cool. Uh, yeah, we can try adding some more stuff in here if you want. So we can say maybe two, three, and four. And then if okay. just one of these was a reject, it should all reject, I believe. Yep. Yep. And it rejects with four. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I think that about wraps up the first problem. So now let's move on to the second one. Uh, I think you can basically delete this entire code. You don't have to keep it in the um, in the code editor. The promise all code, just delete the whole function? Yep. Okay, it is gone. Okay, and I will delete uh, the one in the sandbox, or you can delete it. Okay, I have no idea how the final video is gonna look, but Connor and I just experienced the most annoying technical <laughs> difficulty. <laughs> Like we're like super frustrated, but okay, we're back in the interview. So we had just. Yeah. So a little insider info on what actually happened here. So we were doing this in the sort of mock interview uh, feature of Algo Expert, which is a timed feature. So we had created a mock interview for ourselves and it was timed like any other mock interview, but we had spent a ton of time before we started filming, just sort of chatting and making sure everything was set up correctly. So the interview actually ended, which locks the workspace. So we couldn't use it anymore. 
And then we spent a ton of time trying to like recover the old workspace we had. And eventually we just sort of recreated a new workspace and we got it working. But this was literally like a 30 minute break of trying to figure out how to recover our half completed interview. Finished with the very first question, promise not all. Connor, the second question now is I want you to implement a function called deep equals. Pretty straightforward. It basically takes in two values that can be any values in JavaScript, except functions, because don't worry about functions. And it compares uh, them, it basically sees if they're equal at a deep level, meaning that if you have two objects, it's gonna compare all the values inside the object, including uh, you know, if they're nested objects or nested arrays. That's what we wanna do with this deep equals function. Okay, sounds good. So I think first we can, sort of special case primitives, because primitives we can just use strict equality, right? So we know something's a primitive if basically type of it doesn't equal object. So let's say if... So again, I wish I sort of explained a little bit of my thought process before jumping into the code. I think a good way to think about a deep equals function, well, in more modern times, we do have structured clone now. It was sort of around then, but it's a little bit better supported now. We have structured clone we could use I would assume he would have told me not to use that in the interview. There's also some other ways people do deep equals. Sometimes you just convert both to JSON strings, compare the strings, and then convert back. But one thing I should have just done here, assuming that we weren't going to use any of those ideas and he wanted me to do it more manually, is just sort of walk through what are all of the different cases and then think about it in terms of like one by one, okay, how do we handle all of these different cases, which I think is what I essentially do. I just don't walk through it ahead of time. So it should have been like, okay, we're going to worry about primitives and then we can worry about arrays and then we can worry about other objects or whatever exactly it is that I was thinking about. But I should have explained that all a little bit ahead of time. Type of value one uh, does not equal object. And type of value two does not equal object. So in the case that uh, neither of these were objects. We have primitives. So what? Uh, I put the uh, curly braces at the wrong spot. So in the case that we are in this if check, both are primitives. So we can mostly just return value one uh, triple equals value two. But I think we also need to special case uh, not a number because uh, in the case of not a number, if we did return not a number equals not a number, we would get false. And I would assume we probably want true there. Is that because uh, not a number is of type not a number or type number? So I think it's type number, but okay. whenever you compare it to anything, including itself, it just always gives you false. OK. So let's check if either one of these is not a number. So we can say const is value 1 in an. We can set this equal to is in an value one. And then we can say const is value two in an. We can set this also to be is in an value two. And I think okay. there was a there's a weird quirk here where we need to also check for strings. Like I think is in an of a string is true for whatever reason. So let's also say and is or and type of value one is not equal string. And we'll do the same thing for the other one. No, 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 no. This is a terrible way to do this. I don't know why this is what I was thinking at the time. So there was a point in time when this is sort of how we handled is in an because the is in an function just doesn't really do what you would expect it to do. But there is a new function you can do. So you can use number dot is in an instead. And I made videos on this for front end expert. I now have a short on it. I don't know why this just completely like went over my head and I didn't think about it. And I sort of reverted to the more old school way of doing this. So I think this does actually work what I'm doing here, but you should almost never use is in an instead you should be using number dot is in an. Because why? Because is, is an an of like yeah, so like if I came over to the sandbox, and I do uh, console.log is in a n of a string. I believe we're going to get true, even though it's not in a n. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. 
Oh, and probably even things like, uh, for example, is an an of an object? If you do is an an of an object, is that true? I think oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, so I see. So what this function actually does, even though you shouldn't be using it, is it just converts whatever value you give it into a number, and then it checks if it gets an an. So for example, if you had empty string, converting that to a number would end up giving you zero. So that would be false. You did not get an an. But if you have a string with three a's like I showed here, well, in that case, that is not a number when converted to a number, so you end up getting true. So that's where all of the weird edge cases come from and why it's just not a great function to be using most of the time. Okay, JavaScript, weird JavaScript. So weird then, JavaScript, so then just, I think. It's not just string then. Yeah, I, I think we should be safe with mostly just string here. Um, hold on. Is oh, right, because I think like, so I think the better way to be doing this is to check and that the value is actually of type number. Um, but I guess this not string thing maybe works also. I'm actually not 100% sure. We would a number be would give you primitives here. false. Okay, yeah. So what Clement said I think is correct. Because we are in a place where we know we have primitives, I guess this does actually work. Yeah, because we're only dealing with primitives here, I think we're good with just string. Uh, there might be some weird edge cases that might be worth testing later, but I think mostly just this is fine. Um, okay. We could also do actually end value one. The type of is actually number is probably a safer way to do this. Um, okay. Okay. That way, if there are other edge cases, we won't have to worry about them. Yeah. Okay. So this checks if they are both is in an. So if they are both in an. So if is value one in an. And is value two in an? We just want to return true. And in the case that either of them was, uh, or if it's like an or case where just one is in an, we can just go down to this uh, return statement we already have. And right. then in the case where we had no in an, this return statement should be fine for comparing any other primitives. Okay, so let's. I guess test this real quick with these. So we can do console.log uh, deep equals, and let's just do some primitives that are the same. So we can do deep equals one, one, run this, and we should get true. So yeah, I like that I stopped to test this one ahead of time. Like I didn't really do much with the previous question. So this is a much sort of better and cleaner approach to do one step, test it, do the next step, et cetera. Let me make a few more of these, although clearly I have bored Clement into looking at his other computer that are all going to be true. So let's do, say, the string A and the string A, and maybe we can have, uh, let's do uh, NAN and NAN, and then let's do some false ones as well. So let's do console.log. So the ones below this log should be logging out false. So for example, deep equals one and zero. And let me copy these. So A and B or NAN and let's say the number 10. Run this and yeah, so everything below false is logging out false, which is what we want. Um, and just out of curiosity, yeah. let me see console.log. Uh, I want to see if there's a weird edge case with NAN. Let's do like NAN as a string. Let's see if that's false. Oh, that's that true. is true. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I was like, I was hoping that that that's would just fun. be false, but um, uh, wait, so it's probably it's it's probably so in because, the case. Why is but type of value two should not be uh, that should be string. So is value two NAN should be false. Oh, it's because you, have type, of, value here you one. have type of value one equals number twice. Oh, on okay, line four. nice. I actually think it'll yep. be, yeah, if you rerun, now it'll be Yeah, false. okay. okay. Yeah. This is one of those things that is so strange to me because whenever I'm coding and it's a coding interview or I'm being filmed, anything like that, I find that I constantly am making little typos like this that I don't even notice while I'm doing it. But these are the types of things that if I'm just writing code in my room or in my office, listening to some music, having a good old time, I would never make that mistake. So just sort of strange how the small amount of pressure associated with something like this causes you to create little bugs. 
But when you are encoding into views, it is just a good thing to look out for because you will be under a little bit more stress and pressure than you normally would be when you're just writing code on your own. Okay, cool. Let me just awesome. Add some so, here. does that work? Oh, well, yeah. Who knew? Okay, so let's move on to, I guess, arrays and objects. So let's start with arrays. So let's check if, and actually before that, let's just check if the types are the same. Uh, well, I guess at this point, we know the type is the same. The type of everything is object. Uh, well, actually, that's not true. Yeah, because you could have yeah. a, a number. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, we could have like a number and a string. If value one does not, equal, well, we could have like a number and an object or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So if a uh, type of or oh, yeah, sorry, value not, not one, a number and a string, but you could have a number and an object or a string and an right, object. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we can say if value one or type of value one does not, e or if, yeah, if it does not equal type of value two, then we can simply return false because they can't be equal if they don't have the same type. And now let's handle the array I case. I could have just so done that if from the very beginning. Array dot is array value one and array dot is array value two. So if they are both arrays, then we need to uh, iterate through the arrays and make sure that they have all the same values. So we can say, uh, first of all, let's check the lengths. So we can say if value one dot length does not equal value two dot length, then let's return false. And now we just need to iterate through the arrays to make sure they have the same values. So we can say for let i equal zero, i is less than uh, value one dot length and i plus plus. And we can recursively call deep equal deep equals here to make sure that uh, if there was another array nested inside that it would handle that. So one thing I'd mention whenever doing a JavaScript specific interview is if you decide to use a traditional for loop instead of for each or map or one of the functions of the array, it's usually good to mention why it is that you're doing it. I think it's valid here, I think, because we're probably going to be returning early inside of that for loop, as well as we need to access two different arrays, so we need the index anyways. But it's just a good thing to mention why are you going away from sort of the standard array looping practices. And there are good use cases for a standard for loop. It's just good to sort of show that you were thinking about idiomatic JavaScript. So we can say if deep equals uh, value one at i and value two at i return false, and we need this to be a not. So if these are not the same, we return false. OK. And I guess there's also a case. So I think that should handle arrays. There is also one more edge case, I think, where one of the values was an array and the other was an object, because we wouldn't get into this if check, and we would get below that, and we would uh, because the types would be the same. So on line 11, we would pass that. And then we would skip the line 13 if check. So now we can basically just say, if either of these is an array, then we have have a case where we should just return false because we have an array and an object. Okay. So let's say if, uh, if either one is an array now, let's just return false. And then I'm going to add a return true at the bottom. Uh, we'll need to handle objects in a minute, but first, so I think I could have just added the return true at the end of the array if check. By the way, having it at the bottom is good. But I would have, before even talking about this edge case, liked to see sort of some examples and test cases or just basic array test cases. So before thinking about these edge cases with the arrays and other types, think about simply, does this work for arrays? I think that's what I'm about to do in a moment, but I could have just done that ahead of time rather than sort of moving on to the next edge case. Let's add to our test some arrays. So deep equals 
Let's do an empty array and an empty array. And then let's do an array with, let's say, numbers one and one. And then let's do a nested array. So say one, two, and three, four. And copy this over here. Okay, make this a little bit bigger. And let's copy these into false as well and to make all of these incorrect. So an empty array and say an array with one. Maybe this one is 10 and one. Maybe this one is one, two, and three. Let's run this and let's see. So the falses are all correct, but the trues are not. Um, oh, I guess we can't do this uh, early return thing. The early return on line 20 is actually an issue. So if I comment this out for a minute, this should work. Yeah, so, so this is a point where it looks like I'm sort of guessing a little bit, which is something you never want to do in an interview. You want to show them that you are sort of logically thinking through steps, thinking critically, rather than, oh, I think maybe if I comment this out, it's going to work. And that just sort of ends up showing that you are guessing you may not completely know what you're doing. It's sort of low conviction. So what I would have liked to see me do is if I was confident in that, which I think I was, this was the correct solution. And I need to move that return true into the F check, I think is the cleaner thing to do. But if I was confident in this, I should have explained why this F check is causing the return falses instead of simply commenting it out to see if it works. Why, why Rather than, it work? Okay, yeah, and there, there's Clement immediately asks me why, because he probably didn't follow along with my seemingly random guess that happened to work. So the issue was um, we didn't get to the return true on line 22 because of the if check, because it's just checking. This if check was meant to skip the object comparison if one of them was an array. But um, because they're both arrays, or is also true. So like the if check is true and we haven't returned oh, to right, true Oh, right, right, right. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah. Yeah, so, th so this is not a good way to do, do this. Instead, we should actually check if uh, if one of them is not an object, uh, then we should return uh, false here. Is is there an object dot is object? Is that a Not that I believe. Dot? Yeah, so this is one of those places where I think I jumped into trying to solve it too quickly instead of, again, thinking critically about it because the much simpler approach is just to add a return true at the end of the F check when you have two arrays, and that would have completely solved this. Instead, I'm sort of trying to guess if object is object is a thing. I'm pretty sure it's not. I think if you want to check if something's an object, actually, I'm not sure what the absolute cleanest way to do that is. You could probably check through like the prototype, I guess, but even that isn't great. Yeah, I'm not sure what the best way to check if something's an object is. I'd have to look it up, honestly. Not that is I believe object I don't, I don't is that a thing? So. Or you could just check if the type is object and it's not an array. But I think that sort of goes against the point of what I was trying to do here. No. Okay. Uh, let's. Well, for now, I will just put this code in. Uh... Mm... I'm just going to comment this out for now, and I'll come back to that because it's just a very small edge case. Um, okay. So that's something that I do do a lot in interviews. If there's sort of a small edge case that I know I need to handle, but I'm not exactly sure how to handle it, which in this case, it is very simple, but sometimes the heat of the moment, you can't figure it out. So in those cases, it's perfectly okay to just say, hey, this is something I've noticed. I know we need to handle this. I'm going to leave myself a note and we'll come back to it. I do that a lot in interviews so that you don't get stuck on one thing and end up running out of time. Because if we had the entire thing finished, except for that one edge case, they'd probably still say I did pretty well on this interview. But if this edge case took the rest of the time of the interview and I never got to finish the code, well, then they would say I completely failed it. So if you get stuck on something, don't be afraid to just say, hey, can we come back to this and move on to something else? I'm just not just, sure what the, like, the see, way to actually handle to it, it is. Uh, all works, let me just add another test case where like instead of a three here, maybe you have like one of these as a string. So let's do a three as a string. This should be false. Yep, we still get false. Okay. Cool. Okay, so let's handle objects and then I'll come back to figure out how to do this if check. Okay, so uh, now 
we'll just assume at this point that we have objects because we got past all of the other returns. So okay. if we have objects, we need to get the keys and the values. So let's get all of the entries from both objects. So we can say const value one entries is object dot entries, and we will pass in uh, value one. So then we can do const value two entries is object dot entries value two. Okay, so now if we have a different number of entries in the two objects, we need to return false. So we can say if value one entries dot length. Does object dot entries just return an array? Because if it is, I think we could have just made a recursive call here and not done anything else. I'm pretty sure object dot entries is just an array. Because if it is, it would just be handled by the previous array cases we had. But I guess doing this more explicitly is also fine. Does not equal value two entries dot length, then we can return false. And then we need to check if these two arrays that were returned by uh, object.entries are the same. So I think we can actually just deep equal these. So we can say if uh, not deep equals value one entries and value two entries, because these are just arrays, so they should be handled by this. So if they're not deeply equal, let's return false. Okay, so I did end up actually doing the recursive calls. I just don't think we need that if check above it because that's also handled by the recursive call. Okay. And are, are object.entries always in the same order? Um, so I guess that's a question. Uh, I'm actually not entirely. So it will, if you have the same array and you call object.entries on it multiple times, you will get the same order. I'm not 100% sure if it's going to be in insertion order or like alphabetical order. Um, I think it's actually going, it might be an insertion order. Um, I don't think it's insertion because insertion is specifically what arrays have, right? But either way, I see, okay, um, so if they- One year later, honestly, I still don't know the answer to that. I think, I think it's just going to show up like alphabetized, but I'm not sure. If it is always the same order for object.entries, because I know that object.key is it's you're not supposed to be able to rely on the order of object.keys. Yeah, if it yeah. Is the yeah same I don't think order, we should rely on the order. Object.keys is is basically the same thing as object.entries, just like only getting the first values, I think. So yeah, I don't know that we can rely on this order. You're probably right. So instead of relying on the order and doing this fancy thing, let's just iterate through the object keys or the we could have also just sorted object.entries just using whatever sorting method, uh, just use the default sorting method, and we would then have a consistent order entries to be safer. But I do think it's good to not rely on the order if we're not sure. Um, in reality, if this was something I was implementing, I would just go Google, can you rely on this order or not? But uh, in the sort of moment of an interview, I think either just not doing the recursive call like I do here, or just sorting them would have been good. Okay. Um, yeah. But that, that you can't yeah. iterate through the entries, though, in that case, because like entry at index zero for value one might be different than entry at index zero for value two. Yeah. Just because let's just get the keys. Yeah. So instead of object entries, let's just do object dot keys. Uh, call this value one keys, value two keys. Okay. And we still need to check that we have the same number of keys. And let's iterate through value one keys and check that uh, option or that object two has all of the same values. So essentially, let's go for let i equal zero. And I'm just using a normal for loop so we can uh, return early. Um, so let i equal zero. i is less than value one keys dot length and i plus plus. Okay. So Let's do if deep equals um, value one at, uh, I'll just call it key for now. I'll define that in a moment. 
So we want to check if this is the same as value two at key return false, and we need a not here. And key is going to be, so const key is equal to value one keys at, uh, at i. And then we also need to make sure that the actual key is the same. So right now we're checking that they have the same. Uh, actually, instead of doing it this way, hold on. So let's do, let's do this. Let's say const value one, uh, let's say value is this. Uh, value one at key. So that gets the value from the first one. And then we want to get const value two value is going to be value two at the same key. So we want to make sure that these two things are the same. So I guess this is pretty much the same thing I had. It's just a little bit easier to read value one okay. value and value value to value. And actually, if the keys themselves were different, we uh, are going to end up returning false somewhere anyways, because we know they have the same number of keys. So one of these would end up being undefined at some point if we had a different key. Uh, okay. So yeah, I think, I think this should work for the objects. Um, and then we return true at the end. Yeah, and this no longer relies on the order of the object because it just gets the value out of the other object at the key from the first object. Okay. Okay. So let me try adding a few console logs to the out or the sandbox. Console log deep equals. Let's do an empty object and an empty object. And then let's add, say, a is one, a is one. And let's try nesting an object. Or we need a key there. So the key, I guess, can be obj. b is 2. Copy this same thing over here. OK, and let's copy all of these into the false and to make some false versions. So let's say this one has some value. This one's different. And maybe this is different. OK, let's run this. See, so we get all trues in the true and all falses in the false. So I, th I think this should be uh, working. With One other thing I should have done here is asked about some other edge cases that aren't handled. For example, I didn't ask how do we need to handle two objects with the same key value pairs, but maybe a different prototype, things like that. that would showcase some more knowledge of JavaScript versus here I sort of just treat the objects like maps or dictionaries, which is probably what he intended, but it is something I could have asked about to sort of showcase more knowledge of JavaScript and just that I'm thinking about all of the different edge cases. The exception of this one edge case, so let me see if I can try to make this fail based on this edge case to show you what I mean by this. I'm, so console.log deep equals, so if we had like an empty array and an empty object, we would get past this type of because uh, we have objects. Um, and then you'd get past this because they do have the same type of. We would skip the is array thing. So then we would try to do object.keys on the array, which uh, probably going to give us something strange. Yeah, but it might actually Let's work see. randomly. Yeah, so we end up with true. But we do end yeah, up with we do end okay, up with you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think, I think uh, there's a pretty simple way to fix this, but let, let me see if, what you come up with. Yeah. So I think what we need to do is say um, if uh, if one is an array and the other is not an array, just return false. Right. Uh, the alternative would be check that they are both objects, like actual objects. Um, but I'm not entirely sure what like the simplest way to do that is. I don't know if you have like a, a simpler oh, solution yeah, no, than just actually, no, from... my simpler solution was wrong. The more I think about it, I was just going to say, I was just going to say here, we add a return true on line 18, but, um, um cause right now you're doing if... duplicate work right now. I think, I believe that you're doing duplicate work, like for the, for all these arrays here, I'm pretty sure that. You go through all of this logic, right? 
you never return false, but you didn't have return true. And then you just do all this object logic literally on the arrays and it just works because object.keys kind of works for arrays too. Yeah, yeah, um, no, I think you're right. I think we actually can just have this return true. Um, because, I, and I like think that if you have return true, then you can add this line 21. And then actually, I think it works. I think I'm pretty sure if you run code now, it'll... Uh, oh, I, this was when I was trying to yeah. determine if object that is object is a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that does work. Okay, yeah, that's a lot simpler. There is no worse feeling during a coding interview or even a mock coding interview than thinking super hard about something, not being able to figure it out, and the interviewer shows you it's literally like 10 characters. But that's fine. These types of things happen. Even in a real interview, if something like this happens, you're not going to fail the interview just because of this. At least you shun it with a good interviewer. So yeah, don't worry too much about little things like this. But also, I think it showcases sort of mistakes in how I was thinking about this code more than what I was about to try. So cool. Okay, so now that being said, I do think that you might be missing two edge cases. Two edge cases. Ooh. One um, one is more obvious than the other. One is like I'll give you a hint. I think you forgot like a sort of type, whatever you want to call it in JavaScript for the values. Like there's one big comparison that you forgot. The other one is like a really weird edge case that I think you forgot. Okay, so let's see. We handle uh, NAN. Uh, do we need the special case like null or undefined in any way? Um, yep, it's null. Null. Because null in JavaScript is type of object. So right now, actually, right. let's see if your code works. Like try deep equaling null. Yeah, so let's do deep equals. Just null and null, for example. Null. Null. And yeah. you, oh wait, no, that's well, I, that's just I can't type. But yeah, you see, you get an error because you end up doing object dot keys on null. Right. So um, if so, in that case, we would be type of value. So let's just say have an if check. Let's see. So if they are both null. Uh, so yeah, let's just do that here. We can do that before we do any of the array or object stuff. So if uh, value one is null, well, I guess we should do triple equals here. Yeah, if you value one is null and value two is null, we want to return true. And then if just one of them is null, we'll return false because at this point we shouldn't have a null. So if yep. value one equals null or value two equals null, we can return false. Okay. And just for sanity, let me double check also undefined. That should work, I think, undefined. because Yeah, undefined is. works. Uh, yeah, it does. And let me check the false cases. So let's yeah. do null and undefined like this. And then let's also do like null and some empty object. Yep. Okay, so okay. that all works. I think that works now. now. So an interesting little tidbit about this actually is the reason that type of null is object essentially dates back to the very, very early days of JavaScript when they implemented the first version of type of. It was effectively just a bug that enough people started to write code that used that bug that they couldn't ever remove it because it would break backwards compatibility. So forever type of null is going to be object. I actually have a short on my channel that explains why that bug happened. But yeah, it was essentially just a super old JavaScript bug. Let's move on to the second one. Before I guess I move on to the second one, I just want to say another sort of edge case that you do handle, but that is more like a performance thing. So like imagine we have like this um, const array equals new array of length. 100,000 dot fill yep. a, and then I do console dot log deep equals array array. So this should be true. So it is true, right? But right, we are like kind of iterating through that entire array. Yeah, yeah I, I guess we could 
if they are just the same array, we can just return true or the same object for that matter. Uh, yeah. So let's say below these null checks, we can also do if value one uh, strictly equals value two, then we can just return true. Um, yep, exactly. Cool. Okay, so now let me see if I'm correct that you are missing one more edge case. I'm not sure, but okay. based on how you wrote your code, I think you might be. So for simplicity, let's comment out like everything, okay? Um, okay. And let's do, so console.log deep equals object one, object two. And let me write them out. So object one is gonna be A one, or no, it's gonna be A undefined, and it's gonna be B two. Okay. Uh, B, why is this, let's just add strings over this just to make it work. Okay, and then const, oh, sorry, object, I need to do object one. Object yeah, one that's why the syntax highlighting yeah, is off. And then object two is gonna be equal to B two. And then I guess it's gonna be, uh, so this was A undefined. Uh, it's just gonna be C three, doesn't matter. So I think these are obviously false, right? But I think right. you're gonna return true. You do. We return are true. returning true. I just wanted to say the fact that Clement was able to figure that out in an interview, like just by looking at this code and think of this edge case is super impressive. Uh, even now watching this back, that's not something I noticed as a bug. So yeah, that's just honestly super impressive. Okay. So let's see. So where do we return true for this? So if we go to our sort of object section, value one keys and value two keys are are different. Um, well, let's make sure that we're actually getting here. So we can say console.log value one keys, value two keys. Okay, so we get A, B, and B, C. Um, I mean, like a simple thing we could be doing that would fix this edge case is we could check deep equals on the, the keys themselves. Um, yep. but I, I didn't think we needed to do that. So let me, let me try to figure out where in my logic was wrong about that first. So we loop through value one keys. Uh, we get the key, which in this case, the first one is going to be like a, yep. um, and then the value is going to be. Okay, so this gives you undefined. Uh, yep. And then value two value is... Uh, Undef Clement looks so proud of himself in finding this bug. I just thought that was kind of funny. Because JavaScript is undefined. lets you access the key even if it's not in the object. Right. Rightfully so, though. It's impressive. I would not have found this if somebody was just writing this code in front of me. Okay, see, so yeah, I guess we do have to do the uh, deep equals never, on the keys. Then you never check C because you're only iterating through like value one keys. So technically, right. you could safeguard this by like doing the same iteration on value two keys. You know, right? Then so you we can do that, B or we could just deep equal the keys. I think either one would solve it. Yeah, I think yeah, either one would solve it, and I guess they're. They're not nested. I think the second one is less performant because if you've got a bunch of nested stuff, you don't want to recheck all the nested stuff. So it's better to just like compare the keys. Basically compare that AB is equal to BC, which it is not here. Yeah. Okay, so let's do uh, if, actually I'll do this down here. So if um, not deep equals value one, keys value two keys return false the keys aren't even going to be nested so there's no reason to even be doing deep equals here we probably should have just used like json stringify and then compared those as strings uh because i think this is just a little bit overkill granted it's going to work fine uh and it's probably not actually going to end up having much of a performance difference but I think doing a deep equals on something you know is only one level deep is just a little bit semantically strange. 
And let's run this again. Okay, cool. So now we get false. Let me make sure that everything else is still working. All trues and then all falses. Yep. And okay. I don't think we've added, have we added uh, objects in the tests? Oh yeah, we have. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's some objects in there. Okay. Okay, so I think this is uh, looking good now. Cool. All right, so um, let's jump into the third uh, function. It is the get timer function. So this function takes in a string that is in ISO date format. So that's you know the, the, the date format that looks like this, the comment above that function. That's the kind of okay. string that you would take in. And it should return, whoops, it should return an object that could be used for a timer functionality, like a human readable timer. So this object is specifically gonna have um, hours as a number, minutes as a number, and seconds as a number. And the idea is how many hours, how many minutes, how many seconds in a human readable format are there from any given moment in time, like the moment that you call this, this function, until the date that is passed in. And when I say human readable, I mean like what you would read on a timer, like on your phone. So for example, you know, one hour, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds. And then every second, this function should like update the timer or the object. It should update it to have, you know, the new seconds and minutes and hours left until the given date. And so I guess okay. on that note, I'm remembering that this should also take in an object and this object is gonna be your timer info. So if you want, I can call this like timer info and this timer info is gonna be, you know, like hours, minutes, and uh, seconds. And you should be updating this timer info, the values in okay. this timer info. So is the timer info initially just basically like I have like dummy data, like would like, Yes. The, so for example, so the, here, like we could have like null for the uh, value. Yeah, for the simplicity, let's put uh, like zero, just, you know, always have numbers. But yes, basically you can put whatever you want. So okay, here, you know, sounds you can say good. Timer info equals hour zero, minutes zero, seconds zero, and you would call you know, console.log get timer, uh, with some date, so maybe this date here. Okay. And timer and that info. object. Okay, sounds good. Can I delete this other function? Just to yes, make you can. Space? Okay, cool. And we don't need that. And let me delete it from here as well. Okay, so we need to, first of all, let's get a date based on our ISO date so that we don't have to use this as a string. So let's say const. So again, I should have started with a thought process before going into writing code, um, but that seems to just be a recurring theme here. Date is going to be a new date. We can pass in the ISO date. So I think the date constructor can just take in one of these strings. Yep. Okay. And now we need to get, uh, how uh, how far away the state is from the current time, right? To update the timer info. Okay. Okay. So the const time till date is going to be our uh, date minus date dot now. So date dot now gives us the current time. This is the time in the state object. So this should be the number of milliseconds that have. Uh, that are the difference between these two. Okay. And we'll have to move this, I guess, into a timer function uh, in a moment. But for now, I'm just going to calculate all the values like on the initial for the initial value, and then I'll uh, figure out how to do it in a loop or in a timer. So okay. uh, now we need to figure out uh, this time till date. We need to essentially update timer info with it. So let's say, const and we can do like seconds and 
Seconds can be essentially a conversion of uh, time to date from milliseconds into seconds. So we can do, let's say, like math dot floor uh, time till date. And I think we need to divide by, or not 60, 1,000, because there are 1,000 uh, milliseconds in a second. And then let's do the same thing for, say we need to return minutes and hours, yeah. So const minutes, it's going to be math.floor uh, time till date divided by 60. And the same thing for hours. So const hours is going to be math.floor time till date. And, and actually we don't need to do time till date. We can do uh, minutes, or sorry, seconds here. So we want to divide seconds by 60, and we want to divide minutes uh, by 60 as well, because there's 60 minutes in an hour. OK. OK, so this is going to be like the total. So it's not going to be like that sort of like human readable format. Like you said, it's the, the like total hours, total minutes, and total seconds. So uh, what we want to do is uh, mod those values, essentially. So I think we need to mod both minutes and hours by by 60. Um, okay. Yeah, something of that nature. And and by the way, Connor, just to be clear, because I didn't fully specify that in the question, like you only want to call get timer once, and you want get timer to continuously update timer info. So here, right, technically, right, yeah. like the way that I console log this, timer info to, uh, get timer shouldn't actually return a timer. So it's actually like more like update timer, if that makes sense. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I was going to sort of like get the data once and then stick it in a set interval after I sort of get it to work for like the initial values, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what we want, yep. Okay, so we have seconds, minutes, and hours, and let's update timer info. So we can say timer info it's going to be equal to an object, so we can just make this a new object. And let's see, so I think, yeah, we need to mod seconds and minutes by 60 um, to get that sort of like, because like if you had uh, uh, like an hour, for example, you don't want any seconds because all of that time has uh, uh, has been like, it's being displayed in the hours. It's not. It doesn't need to be displayed in the seconds or the minutes. So we can say seconds is going to be uh, seconds mod sixty. Um, minutes is going to be minutes. I believe we can just do mod sixty here as well, and then we can just have hours. Okay. So this I think should update our timer info, and then we just need to do this in an interval. How often did you say you wanted to update it? Uh, every second. Every second, okay. Or even, or even every half a second. Okay, so let's do a uh, set interval and can add a function and it's just going to do all of this. Uh, let's see. So this is another place where I probably should have tested this once before moving it into the set interval. After all, I sort of stated that as the whole purpose of doing it outside of the set interval first. So yeah, I would have liked to see me throw some console logs in and sort of test that all of that math was actually working correctly. Oops. And then, let's see, do we need to do... So time till date, uh, we need to calculate here as well. And we will do this, you said, every half a second? Yep. And do we want to... Uh, sorry, let me fix this. Uh, is that? No, it was right before. This is another one of those things where just like in the moment of sort of the pressure and stress, just like fixing indentation becomes hard somehow. But, oh, Wait. this is, that's how it should be. Unindent. Okay, yeah. part of it was right, yeah. part of it wasn't. Okay, there we go. So do we need to return anything from the, like do we return timer info or... No, so that's what I was trying to clarify is that basically this is more updating the timer info, not okay. getting the timer info. But are you updating timer info correctly? 
Um, based on you saying that, probably not. Let's see. So we say we set timer info equal to a new object with seconds, minutes, and hours. Um, so the usage here is basically like in sandbox, I should be able to do like console.log timer info. Yeah, so I think this showcases that I didn't fully understand the question. Um, so I probably should have asked more clarifying questions and like the code I've written here doesn't actually even do anything because all it does is change the parameter, but uh, it doesn't actually update the original object. It creates a new object and updates the parameter, but not that original object. Uh, but that's sort of just showing that I didn't fully understand the question I was being asked, which means I should have been asking more clarifying questions. Multiple times, right? And it always gets like updated. Oh, I see what you mean. This is creating a new object instead of updating the object you have. Uh, yep. So yeah, that's not going to work. You're right. So we need to, instead of doing it this way, we can do like, let me delete this line and this, and we can say like timer info dot seconds is going to be equal to this. I don't know why I kept on adding more indentation every time I did things like this. I was completely like, messing up all of the indentation in this function. It looks way less cool this way. Timer info <laughs> dot minutes like that. And then timer info dot hours equals hours. Okay. Yeah, so now that should update the same object rather than ever creating a new one. Okay. Yep. So let me try this in the console. So this is update timer now. Yeah, now I so, will I will say that uh, I'm just realizing that this will be tricky to test because... Is it going to time out on Algo Expert? Uh, I'm not sure that it'll time out, but we just won't see the interval running. Uh, so basically, like, I think, you know, uh, you're just yeah, going to, like... I, if I just if run you this, run we're just going right? to... Yeah, so we never added this question to front-end expert, but we do have some questions with timers, and I think that's the most frustrating thing I've ever had to implement, was trying to get the test to actually work with the timers in the sort of algo expert, front-end expert, sort of, like, testing environment. But we do now have things like this actually working in tests, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah gonna so, get, okay, like, so zeros. first of all, there's a bug. No, first of all, there's a bug right now. Um, it shouldn't be zeros, if I'm not mistaken. But also, it just, you'll have to run code multiple times to get it to be updated. Well, I think it's, if we did like, it's getting zeros right now because the uh, set interval is like pushing it to like the end of the event loop. So this code is running oh, before yes. the interval ever runs. So we need to do yeah, like so set actually, timeout and if we did one of these in a set timeout, then this one wouldn't give us zeros. Say like, I guess we don't really need a value here. I think we can just do zero. No, Probably you would need, need more zeros. than 500. You would need more than 500. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Or no, because set just... interval runs immediately. Uh... Try, try this. Try removing the interval just to see. Because the interval works. That's what we want, right? But try removing the interval. Right. And then we shouldn't need the timeout yeah, here either then. Out. Assignment to a constant variable. Uh, You're doing equal instead of minus on line six. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, so we get five hours, 31 minutes and 21 seconds. Okay, and that is correct. That is because if you look at the date, the date is in Pacific time. That's what the minus 07 at the end is, like seven hours uh, before UTC. And um, it's June 2nd. Right now it's 6.30 or 6.28 uh, PST, PM. So, yep, five hours, 31 minutes. That just shows how long this took us to film because of the sort of technical errors we had in the beginning. Because I do not think we started filming this anywhere near 6.30 PM. It's 21 seconds. Now, if you keep running it, look, if we run it again, five hours, 30 minutes, 55 seconds, right? 52, 51, 50. So it's, <laughs> it's working. Uh, we cannot test the set much. interval. I didn't yeah. really realize that. And yeah, I just broke our... our um, yeah, our, getting our rate, rate limited limiting. on your, your... Yeah. On my um, own product. I mean, um, but but yes, we can't test the set interval on Algo yeah, Expert. But... That being said, I think that what you did works perfectly and that's what we would yeah. want.
Cool. Okay. So, um, and yeah, with the set interval, you see this like breaks completely. Before, I think it was yeah. it was breaking out of it because you had that error. Um, but yeah, the the equal the equal here instead of the minus was I think in our like RCE engine remote code execution engine it was like breaking out of the set interval or something. I'm not sure, but either way, um, yeah, this works. I think this is perfect code. So yeah, that is the end of this reaction sort of breakdown video. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, maybe we'll do more of these. We've done four of these interviews, so I could react to the other ones if y'all want, as well as make sure to check out Clement's channel as well and this original video. I'll link it down in the description below. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.